Welcome to the 87th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Mark Chadbourne. Mark is an English fantasy, science fiction, and horror author with 15 novels published around the world. His latest novels published in the U.S. was The Kingdom of the Serpent Trilogy, Jack of Ravens, The Burning Man, and his latest, Destroyer of Worlds. Stay tuned for the interview. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Mark Chadbourne. Mark's latest novels published in the U.S. are The Kingdom of the Serpent Trilogy, which was published back-to-back, a book coming out in March, April, and May. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Hello, Jeff. Glad to be here. Sure. Well, first, can I ask you to read the first three or four paragraphs of Destroyer of Worlds, book three in the Kingdom of Serpent, Kingdom of the Serpent trilogy? Sure. Okay. Snow falls, a flurry caught in the unforgiving wind blowing relentlessly across the frozen wastes that stretch to the horizon. In that wind, there are whispers, lost souls, telling of the end of the world, of all worlds. Their stories are caught in the ruddy glare reflected in the rolling snow dunes and the crested waves of ice. High in the silver sky, the burning man looks down on this place and the shimmering city of gold and glass at its heart, as he looks down on all places, waiting to cast the final judgment. The towering outline of fire is still waiting to be filled, but it will not be long now. It is the twilight of the gods and men and all living things. Ragnarok. Dreaming, yet awake, you understand this as you move out from the confusion of the world tree's branches and drift across the desolate landscape. The whispers have told you what was and what will be, what is real and what is not. You move on quickly. You want to see more. Worry knots your thoughts that perhaps this time it will not be all right. There we go. Great. Well, if the listeners haven't heard about the Kingdom of the Serpents trilogy before, how would you describe the novels? Um, The novels are part of a nine book sequence, really, but they they do stand alone. And it's it's what happens when the, the old gods return to the world we've got today. Great. Well, well, do you do you remember kind of the original idea or impetus for the the nine book uh, series, the 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 trilogy of trilogies, so to speak? Sure. I mean, um, it was dealing with lots of things that were uh, floating around my head for for years. Probably ever since I was a kid, I was always interested in mythology and legends and folklore. And um, here in the UK, we've, we've got lots and lots of sites that are linked to these old tales, as has many countries, obviously. And um, I visited uh, Avebury Stone Circle one day, and I was reading about the uh, the myths that surrounded this prehistoric stone circle and talks about the old gods that came there. And I sat at dawn and watched the sun come up over the stones, and the story just unfolded in my mind and I started piecing bits together. I came home, made lots of notes, uh, thought it sounded an interesting idea and something I wanted to give a lot of time to and um, then set out researching it. And did you know at the outset that it was going to be a nine book series or, or when did when did that kind of uh, unfold for you? Uh, when did I go crazy, do you mean? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I didn't say that. You did. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was. It started off just – it was going to be just one book. And then the more research I did, uh, the story just swelled. I could see lots of themes. Um, I decided I wanted to cover 2,000 years of human history, um, this world, the, the mystical Celtic other world and the land after death. Uh, and suddenly it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And I thought, okay, it has to be nine books. Well, I I, I thought at one point it's got to be 12 books, but that was really crazy. So (laughs) I constrained it to nine books. And um, after my editor had picked herself up off the floor, we we decided to move on with that. that. That must have been dawning when you were starting the first book. At that point, did you know it was going to be nine books? I did, yes. Yeah, because um the only way I can make that story work was to know 
the how it flowed across the nine books. So I'd already got the ending of the ninth book in my head uh, and the endings of all the previous books before that when I started writing because there's there's elements in the first book that pays off in the ninth and elements in the second book that pays off in the seventh. And to get that, that continuity and those flowing strands of story, you've really got to keep it all in your head from the beginning. So it was daunting, and I, I did wonder if or worry if I'd get to the end of it. But it was a, it was a personal voyage for me, um, a, a real challenge, and it kept me excited to keep coming back and, and doing it. That, that's great. So, so I wonder if you could talk a minute about the, the process for, as you just described, in effect, plotting or at least having some sense of the, the overall story arc of, of the nine books. And as you said, kind of weaving, uh, the, weaving ideas, you know, that, that pay off from one book to the next. What, what was that process like for you? Well, I don't believe in overly plotting any stories because I think it sucks the life out out of the story itself. So I think in terms of tent poles, where I, I know where I begin, I know major incidents along the way, and then I leave lots of space in between them to sort of fill in when I'm writing because the un- unconscious does all the best work or the, the most creative work. So I, I, I've got a very vague structure. I know where the characters need to be at certain points um, and then I leave the rest for when I'm writing for inspiration to strike or or when I'm out on the road researching because I I traveled all around the UK um, while I was researching these books and all the the old sites they were set in Um, and then once I've got that overarching structure I tend to look at the sort of smaller threads below that again where they need to be so it's I keep it all in my head. I originally started trying to write it down, but you needed a pretty much a three-dimensional diagram to um, <laughs> to show all the connections. So you know, paper wouldn't work. I was continually flicking backwards and forwards through notebooks. So I just trained myself to keep it all in my head. Wow. I mean, there's casts of there's a cast of I don't know hundreds maybe through it. That's impressive. So you you started out as a novelist writing supernatural thrillers, but then you moved into writing fantasy novels like the type that we've just discussed what what prompted that shift for you well the the supernatural thrillers i wrote all all had a sort of mythological fantasy element in them um although they were they were more colored towards the horror end of the spectrum um and i reached a point where this story just came to me and i thought okay i want to go down this path now and my editor was you know great to just let me let me go with what I wanted to do because sometimes it's hard to move from one genre to the next. I think. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I presume part of the uh, the factoring in in her thoughts was the fact that horror wasn't doing so well then. So she thought, okay, let's give fantasy a try, and it, it seemed to have been a good move for the publisher as well because the sales were pretty good. That's great. And and what has your experience been been working with Pyre in the US? Were, were the books were the was the first trilogy already published in the UK before they were published in the US? And and, and what's been your, your experience with Pyre? Okay, all all nine books have been published in the UK um, before Pyre bought the uh, the first three. Oh wow. So I think they'd They'd seen the response um, that was coming over here in the in the UK, and the editor there, Lou Anders, was very interested in in the books and the topic himself. And we we exchanged loads of emails, and Lou's absolutely great. He knows all the genres inside out. I mean, he's a fantastic editor. He's um, he's got lots of vision, and it was it was a joy to work with him. To be honest. Um, he he understood the books. He knew the kind of covers. I think the Par editions have got the best covers of any of my books anywhere in the world. And, you know, that's partly because Lou's such a great art director as well as, you know, an editor. Um, and, yeah, he he came up with this plan to release them uh, three consecutive years, um, books one, two, and three, you know, a month apart, each one, and then on so people could pick up the story and move very quickly through it rather than, you know, let it stretch out towards infinity, I think, and readers seem to like that as well. That's great. That's great. And and did the books change at all from the the UK editions outside of the artwork? 
No, no, not at all. Um, you've probably got all the uh, very bizarre British spellings in there, I think, if... Uh, <laughs> if Right, so uh, that should baffle a few uh, a few people reading it, probably. But um, no, no, they, they came over as it were. I think Lou wanted to sort of be true to the original books and to publish the um, them as they were written without any changes. So, right. you know, I was happy to let him do that. Well, I, I know that before you started publishing novels and fiction that you worked as a journalist. Did you always know that you wanted to write fiction when you were working as a journalist? I knew I wanted to write fiction from when I was a, a kid, really. I was writing um, short stories as soon as I could write. And uh, when I was at university, I, I wrote a novel which was so bad it never left my room. Um, <laughs> but it was amazing to write it. So... I put that on one side and I just kept, when I was working as a journalist in the day, I was writing novels in the evening, um, just trying to learn the craft, learn the skill. It's a totally different kind of writing. Um, I found that the journalism actually contributed to uh, writing fiction. It taught me, it showed me the world, it showed me people, it got me behind the skin of things. Um, and I collected vast amounts of information that I've poured into the books ever since. It also taught me to meet deadlines. So, you know, editors tend to like that. <laughs> yes, yes. So given your, your experience thus far, what tips or advice would you offer for aspiring writers? Uh, the most important thing to me is to, to finish a novel. If you can get to the end of a novel, contribute all that invest all that time, invest all that effort when you've got the rest of your life going on, you will be a writer. It's, you're going to get published sooner or later somewhere, whether you you know publish it yourself on Amazon or whatever, you will get there because it is such a mammoth task and so many people fall. They, they do three chapters, go back and revise, go back and revise. Just plow on, get to the end. When you learn so much just by going through that process, and that to me was the most important thing, finishing that first novel. I knew then that I could write a novel and I knew I could see where my flaws were at the end and I knew what I had to change and I knew then that I'd got the stamina to go back and do it all again. So, you know, that would be my, my biggest tip to anybody. That's great. What what books, fiction or nonfiction, have you read lately that made an impact on you and that, that you would recommend? Um, at the moment, I'm reading The Devil's Guide to Hollywood by uh, the screenwriter Joe Esther House, which is, <laughs> I would say, writers, because it shows you how terrible the business is. Um, and there's not a huge amount of difference between the business in screenwriting and the business of publishing books. And I think it's worth, if you want to be a writer, it's worth having your eyes open when you go in because it is a very tough, hard headed business. So I'd, I'd certainly uh, recommend that. Um, I read Stephen King's latest, um, the, uh, the time travel novel right. and enjoyed that a great deal. That was fantastic. I thought a real uh, return to form for Stephen King. Um, one of my favourite books is a book called Little Big by John Crowley. Um, it came out in the 80s, but I only read it quite recently. Uh, it's, it's a sort of whimsical fantasy story, but to me it's, it showed what a writer can aspire to. It's a story about stories. It's, um, it's a story that manages to be both mundane in talking about the real world, but also incredibly magical. And it operates on so many different levels. And I think, you know, if you if you read that, you, you can see what you can do. And it's always great to set the bar really high for yourself to aspire to something. That's interesting. I still haven't read that book. And ironically, in kind of a small world story, he actually lives in my town. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I, I need to get around to interviewing him. Oh, right, right. He's got a, <laughs> a great command of the English language. Um, you know, I really admire his work. You should read it. Yes, yes, I should. So so what are you working on now? What, what's up next for you? I'm, um, I've just finished a three-book sequence, Elizabethan fantasy of swash, swashbuckling spies and 
the uh, the dark world of theory. So uh, the final book of that is coming out from Pyre, I think, um, either at the end of this year or early next year. And I'm just sitting down and putting together ideas for what I want to do next. So I'm. Um, and, and what's been, what's uh, what's that? What is that uh, trilogy? What is the name of that? It's called Swords of Albion is the overarching name of this trilogy. The first book was The Silver Skull. The second book was The Scarcrow Men. And the third book is The Devil's Looking Glass. Great, great. And where can people find you online? Do you have a website? Yes, uh, I've got a blog called um, www.jackofravens.com, which is where I just pour all sort of bizarre things out of my head on there. I'm on Twitter, um, at Chad Bourne. Find me on Facebook, um, Tumblr, always, forever. I'm all over the place. So uh, search. Well, I try to get back to people. They've got interesting queries. So, uh, you know, it's good Great. to share, I think. Great. And I'll have links to all of those in, in the show notes as well. People can check those. Well, again, we've been speaking with Mark Chadbourne, author of many fantasy novels, including the most recent Kingdom of Serpents trilogy. Mark, thanks for doing the interview. Thanks a lot, Jeff. That was great. Bundling home and car insurance with GEICO is so easy, your neighbors are probably already doing it. But who? They may drop little hints like... Beautiful day out. Even more beautiful since we saved by bundling our home and car insurance with GEICO. Or... Yard work is hard. Much harder than bundling with GEICO, which was easy. Or it may be even subtler, like... Speaking of burgers, we bundled our home and car insurance with GEICO and saved a bunch of money. Bundling is easy with GEICO. Just ask your neighbors. And now it's GEICO's Motorcycle Rules of the Road. Before you ride, make sure your mirrors are clean and adjusted properly. And if you're going on a group ride, make sure the lead biker knows where they're going. Uh, Ed, quick question. Where are you taking us? Oh, I have no idea. Well, am I the leader? <laughs> because I was uh, following that dude with the red helmet. Where, Where is he? And the rule to saving on motorcycle insurance is, in 15 minutes, GEICO could save you 15% or more.